Hey folks, Phil Zito here and welcome to BAM TV episode two, how to program part dos. All right, so what we're gonna go through, actually before I go there, one really quick announcement. If you haven't watched part one, you probably wanna do that before you watch part two because it's not gonna make a lot of sense if you're watching part two without having watched part one. All righty. So with that being said, what are we going to go through in today's episode? Well, we're going to go through what common logic blocks are. So what are different types of logic blocks? We'll go through all sorts of different stuff with that. Then we're going to talk through how to interpret sequences and turn them into code. We're going to talk about code layout and design strategies. And we're going to talk about the secret to fast coding. So we're going to spend some time on the whiteboard and then we're going to switch over to my desktop and I'm going to take you through some stuff there. So let's do it. All right. So common logic blocks, what are they? Well, the common logic blocks are going to be Boolean logic blocks, comparative logic blocks, math logic blocks, flow and sequence and loop logic blocks. And we'll try to get through all those as quick as possible. We're not gonna go into the level of depth I go to in my programming course, but nonetheless, we'll go through kind of each one, we'll give an example. Okay, so Boolean logic. This is kind of the first stuff that everyone learns. So we're gonna list them out here, right? Boolean. And we're just gonna talk about one of the most actually two of the most common logic blocks, an AND block and an OR block. Okay, so Boolean, if you watched the previous video, what does that mean? It means a two-state object, right? On or off, true or false, one or zero. So what happens is on any logic block, you've got inputs and outputs, right? Inputs and outputs. Now, the big, these are like blocks that you're going to use all the friggin' time in your programming. So Boolean is like Boolean, comparators, and I would say loop blocks, like PID blocks. Those would be my primary focus area if I were you. And I'm like, man, I want to get good at this programming stuff. I would focus on like those three kind of types of blocks. You get those down, you'll be pretty rock solid. Okay, so Boolean blocks. So what happens is, and we'll just draw like a little truth table here, right? So... Um, this will be input one, this will be input two, and then this will be output one. Okay, so on an AND block, what's going to have to happen is one AND one have to be true in order for the output to be true. So input one, input two, both of them have to be true for the output to be true. If either of them are false, then the output will be false. Now that's an AND block, okay? AND block. And then an OR block, this one right here, right? OR AND. Awesome. All right, so an OR block can be either one. So this could be true, false. This could be false, true. It doesn't matter. If one of those is true, then we're going to get a true, okay? That's Boolean blocks. Now, there's many other types of blocks, NOTs, NEGATES, XORs, all sorts of stuff like that. Now, let's focus in on comparative comparative, which I cannot spell. I'm not known for my spelling abilities. So if you're coming here for reading rainbow, you're going to be sorely disappointed. But comparators are where you compare two values. They're often signified by a triangle. Okay. There's a fancy type of comparator called a, oh my gosh, I just said I can't spell the hysteresis. So dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Who knows how that should be spelled. But there's a fancy block called a hysteresis, which it actually has an up and a down. I'm not going to go through that here. It's kind of a more complex block. But comparators, you have kind of three types of comparators. Greater than, equal to, or less than. And this is what's going to drive a lot of your switches. This is what's going to enable a lot of your PID loops. This is what's going to drive a lot of your logic, basically. Now, whereas Boolean, are they're taking Boolean values... These are taking integers and floats and doubles and decimals, basically numerics. So this would be, you know, zone temp and then zone temp set point, okay? It would compare the two greater than, less than, is zone temp, well, let's say this is greater than. If zone temp t temperature is greater than zone temp set point, then we want to enable our cooling PID loop. So that would be comparative blocks, okay? 
And then we're going to move on to math blocks. Actually, I think I'll put math right here. Yes, math blocks. Let me make sure that you can see this. How far can my hand go? All right, math blocks. I don't think I need to belabor the point on this, but I'm going to go through it anyways. You have your basic blocks, right? Subtraction, addition, multiplication, and division. Then you have other blocks. You have some blocks. You have average, these kind of things. And quite honestly, the only thing you really need to know about this is that subtraction and division, you've got to be really careful with numeric placement. So for example, if I put, if I've got a division block, right? And I put four divided by two, that is completely different than two divided by four. Makes sense? So numerics or math rather, division and subtraction, you got to be careful with. Multiplication and addition, you can pretty much put the values wherever you want. You're going to get the same result. I know we're flying through this. And like I said, in my programming course, I spend, I think, like two and a half hours going through logic blocks. But this is a YouTube video. And I don't know how many of you want to watch four hours of me talking about blocks on YouTube. So flow. Flow is known for their blocks like multiplexers, demuxes, demultiplexers, and the most famous flow block, the switch. The switch is one of my favorite blocks. And I started off this lesson by saying, hey, if you learn a couple different blocks, if you learn Booleans, comparators, flow, I think I mentioned flow, and loops, PID stuff, then you're going to be awesome. You're going to be solid. Basically, what happens is you've got a Boolean trigger for the switch. So a uh, true false trigger. Now that Boolean could be what you could do actually is you could take this value right here and make that output trigger the switch. And then the switch will take, it can pass through Booleans or numerics, which we'll just call NMs. But basically, and this depends on the manufacturer software, but typically in one input state one is the off position of the switch and input state two is the on position of the switch. Now, some manufacturers have that flipped. There's no hard set rule, but basically when it's on, one of the inputs will pass through. When it's off, the other input passes through and that is the switch. The switch is awesome. Now, what's the difference between a switch and a multiplexer, okay? So a MUX is like a switch, except for it has states. So a multiplexer can take multiple different inputs and based on a state trigger can go and write multiple different output types. So you'll see this in state machines. So stateful programming, a uh, common stateful object would be an occupancy object where you have off, unoccupied, standby, and occupied. You would pass through that four state object into a multiplexer and that multiplexer could then drive four different logic states based on the state of that incoming object. Does that make sense? Think about it this way, right? If you have ever worked on a fan that has low, medium, high, right? That's a three speed switch. That switch, when you turn it to low, you get a low output. When you turn it to medium, you get a medium output. When you turn it to high, you get a high output. That's the same thing with a MUX multiplexer. All right, sequence logic. This one is not in my, it's, it's in a, what do I say here? Uh, it's an important logic block but I see way too many people rack their brain on this logic block because they overthink it. And I get why they overthink it because let's look at a sequencer, right? So you've got a sequencer block and maybe it drives four Boolean outputs. So Boolean output one, Boolean output two, Boolean output three, Boolean output four, okay? 
and coming in is maybe an output from your PID loop, which is zero to 100% typically. Well, what happens is inside this block, we've got a bunch of different variables and this confuses the heck out of new programmers, all right? So these variables, you've got min on, min off, okay? So for each stage, you have a min on, min off time, typically. This is especially true when you're staging on heat, staging on compressors, staging on chillers, etc. And then you have a min load or what I like to call a min up and then a min unload or a min down. Now, what is the difference? Here you go. So, I get this PID loop and I have a min for this stage of 25 for my load and let's say it's 15 for my unload. So at 25% or greater, I am gonna go and turn on this stage. If the PID input drops below 15, I'm gonna unload the stage, I'm gonna turn it off. Only if, however, I've met my min runtime. And then if, after I've met my min runtime and I've unloaded the stage, after that, if I go and I've got, boom, it goes right back up against 25 again, I've got a min off time that I have to meet first. This is to prevent something that's called short cycling, where stuff goes on, off, on, off, on, off. All right, so we're running out of space here, so I'm gonna clear off the board, and then we're gonna be right back. So give me just a second. Booyah, the magic of editing, folks. It's magically clean. Oh my goodness, I just snapped my fingers. If only I could do that with my kids. All right, so loop blocks. Loop blocks are known for a lot of different blocks, but the most common block is the PID block. Now I've got a YouTube video that spends 30 minutes going through PID, so I'm not gonna give you a lecture on PID. I will link to that video in the comments though, so enjoy that beautiful gem. But what's going on with PID is basically you've got a process variable that's also known as your sensed input, whether that's pressure, temperature, whatever. You've got a set point, okay? And the difference between process variable and set point is known as error, okay? Now, what happens is inside your controller, you have a processor. And your processor processes code. You know, I really liked when I started off early in my career with Allerton because you had to name the individual or number the individual blocks 100, 200, 300 in sequence. And that is the order in which the controller would execute the code. It really helped me learn and appreciate the importance of code execution and code order and when do you do certain things. And it made me really appreciate this loop. I find that a lot of BAS folks really don't understand what is going on with this controller process. Because what is happening, a lot of folks think this PID loop is just running and is doing some mythical, magical, you know, mid-earth, I'm Lord of the Rings kind of stuff. And it's just P PFM, pure freaking magic, right? But it's not. It's actually very structured calculation that determines the output. So basically what it does is it's got P, right? Your proportional difference between, so it's a proportional response by this error. And it says, hey, based on this error, I'm giving you this much output. So your first part of your output is P. Then it says, how long has this output existed? And that's your I. And then it's got this counteractive effect. So I increases and D decreases the output. So D will decrease the output. However, in my professional, correct, yet humble opinion, that P and I are really all you should be doing in most scenarios. You can use D in certain scenarios where you gotta have really tight control. In most scenarios, P and I are gonna be good enough. So you've got P plus I, and you've got these in this loop. 
Well, what happens is usually every 500 milliseconds to every one second, this loop will go and rerun itself, meaning it will recalculate the equation. So this equation in here, which the YouTube video I share with you goes through, is going to recalculate every 500 milliseconds to one second. That is what you're adjusting when you're tuning your loop. You're adjusting the P and the I values. And by the way, just a side note, P is a constant. So P will have a constant response to error. So really, once you get P narrowed down, you should be focusing on I. I see a lot of folks who try to tune their loops by constantly adjusting their P. P is probably the easiest thing for you to narrow down. It's your I that you want to get right. And you have to go and determine kind of, hey, my integral increase, how much do I want that to be? How responsive is my loop? Okay, so that's logic blocks. That is it for logic blocks. Now we're going to go to the desktop. We're going to go through interpreting sequences to code. This is super freaking important because this is going to determine whether your programs suck or whether your programs are awesome. Then we're going to go through code layout and design strategies. And then we're going to go to the secret to fast coding. All right, folks, I'll see you on my desktop. Thanks a ton. Booyah. All right, we are back and now we're on my desktop. So let's dive in. So how do you interpret sequences and turn them into code? You know, if I handed you something that looked like this, how would you code it? Where would you start? Would you just start following along each line one after the other and just writing the code and hoping that you got everything? If you say yes to that after watching BAM TV episode one, that means either I was not clear in my five-step programming process or you didn't pay attention. And since I was very clear in my programming process, it means you probably didn't pay attention. So if you're sitting there wondering that question right now, go watch the five-step programming process in episode one. All right. With that being said, let's dive in. So. In order to do this right, what you need is you need five highlighters. You're going to print this sucker out right here. And what you're going to do is you're going to go and you're going to highlight. You're going to have a highlighting extravaganza of fun and excitement and staring at hundreds of pages of printed sequences. No, but in all seriousness, you really do need to have five highlighters. And I recommend you get a yellow, pink, blue, orange, and green. You can pretty much pick those up from any Walmart or Office Depot. Now, here are the colors, okay? So yellow is going to be inputs and outputs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through my sequence, and I'm going to say, oh, supply fan, that's a output. And then I'd say, oh, do I have a supply fan status? Oh, that's a status. That's an input, and I'm going to go through and I'm going to highlight all of those. Then I'm going to go through pink, and it's very important that you use the colors I recommend because if you have to highlight over anything, you don't want to have yellow and blue highlighting potentially over stuff because that could make green and all sorts of just craziness. So with that being said, pink is set points and variables. So, oh, look at that, a set point. I need that. Oh, look, a variable right there. So that is my heating set point. Oh, look, I've got another variable, which is my limit for my runtime. This is a really awesome sequence. It's almost like I picked this sequence out so that it would perfectly highlight everything I'm teaching in my agenda, but that would mean I actually planned this out, which, oh my goodness, that would be a first. So with that being said, blue. Blue is going to be Boolean modes. Remember when we do our programs, right? Inputs, outputs, set points and variables. Step one, Boolean modes. Step two, actually Boolean modes are step three, set points and variables are step two. Oh man, I just broke my own five-step process. And analog modes are step four, and safeties are step five. So analog modes are orange. What would be an analog mode? Oh, maybe this right here where I'm measuring mixed air temp and modulating the preheat valve? Hmm, maybe. 
And then green is safeties because green means go, right? So I want to go through and say, what would be my shutdown safeties? All righty. And that is what I would do. So then what I'm going to do next is I'm going to start to chunk out my programs, okay? So we got to ask ourselves, what on a rooftop do you think is probably the first thing we're going to do? We're going to turn on the unit, right? But what is the first thing? Now, a lot of you are going to be tempted to say, turn on the supply fan. You are bad. Bad answer. No, it's open the economizer. 95% of air handlers have to have some damper open before you ever freaking turn on a fan or you're going to blow ductwork, safeties, all sorts of craziness. All right. So we got to go and start ordering how this unit's actually going to start. It's not going to start with the supply fan. It's going to start with that damper, right? So we're going to go down here and we're going to find out our damper. What makes our damper open, okay? And we're going to start to number out and chunk out that logic. And what I would do is I would just start to copy and then I would open a Word document. And here's how I would do it, right? I would start, oh no, there we go. I would just start doing this right here. Okay, economizer. Hey, economizer, how how nice of you to be right there. I'm going to put you right here. And I would just start copying this. And I'd say, oh, okay. All right, there's my economizer. And, oh, that's kind of ugly. How did that happen? So let's go here. And let's, there we go. I don't know what this thing is doing, why it's using symbols. I have no idea, but we are going to make it not symbols. There we go. So you see kind of how I'm copying and pasting this, right? And then I would say, okay, once the economizer's on, then I'm going to turn my fan on. So then I go up here and I grab my fan section logic. And that goes here. I say, okay, now that the fan's on and I've got my economizer open, then let's hit preheating. Why would I hit preheating before anything else? Think about that for a second. I want you to think while I'm doing this copying. Why would I do preheating before anything else? Think about this rooftop unit, right? It's got a preheat, a cooling, and a reheat valve. Which valve do and which coil, rather, do I hit first? Which coil do I, does the airstream run into first? It's the preheating, right? So we want to do preheat right after the fan. Now, cooling coil. What do we run into after the preheat? We run into the cooling coil and then we run into the reheat. Okay. So that is how I would go and copy my sequence. And so then you've got everything beautiful. It's all reorganized. It's all in the proper flow and you can start writing your programs. Okay. So how do you write your programs? Let me pause the video and I'm going to open up the actual program for this unit. So if you're part of my BAS programming course, first off, thank you. I love you all. It's crazy to me that 130 folks bought the course in the first five days. That's awesome. But with that being said, if you're part of my programming course, it's going to look really familiar to you because this is the program from module seven that you had to write. Now, we're looking at this program, right? And we look at the sequence. So let's talk about organization, right? At least in most of the Western world, folks read from left to right. So what we're doing here is we've got our code and we're going from left to right, top to bottom. And I'm laying out according to the sequence. So if I go into the sequence, we see that the sequence starts with run conditions and then moves to supply fan, then moves to preheat valve. You'll see run conditions, fan over here, preheat valve, cooling valve, heating valve, outdoor air damper. Now, 
what I'm doing is I'm making whoever comes after me, I'm making their life so freaking easy. Oh my gosh, if people only did this for me back when I was in the field, holy moly, that made my life so much easier. But what I'm doing here is I am actually going and I am laying out the code so that if you came up to this code and you didn't know anything, you literally could know the sequence by looking at the code because the code follows the sequence. You want to become a awesome programmer overnight you want to have instant increase in your programming abilities and capabilities this is how you should structure your code i've written hundreds if not thousands of programs and out of all the crazy ways that i've written code and i've done some stupid crap in my life this is by far the easiest way to write code and the easiest way to make code serviceable and readable all right now, there are some other things you can do. For example, you can use folders and you can use mux blocks. I'm not going to go through that in this specific program. Now, this is the EasyIO software, right? And the EasyIO software is all kind of contained within the CPT tool. And so what I do with their software is I actually create the alarms here so that I can then go and reference these alarms directly in my graphics. Now, with that being said, some manufacturers, they really separate their field controller and their supervisory device. EasyIO combines those together. Now, I'm not going to say whether one is better than the other. You all know by now I'm vendor agnostic. However, what the fact that they combine this together allows me to do is to create my alarms in the program and then reference those directly on my graphics. With other manufacturers, you would want to eliminate alarms and you would do those in the supervisory device. No one way is necessarily better than the other. It's just knowing the software and the hardware that you're working with and then building your programs accordingly. Now, this program right here, I think it took me about eight minutes to write. Now, you may be saying to yourself, Phil, eight minutes? What? How did you write a full-blown rooftop in eight minutes? And it all comes down to something called design patterns. And I'm going to show you what a design pattern is real quickly. And once you learn design patterns, oh my gosh, the, the floodgates of awesomeness will open and the lights from heaven will shine down upon you and you will become the glorious programmer you've always wanted to be. Okay, I know that sounds a little cheesy, but I'm completely serious. When you learn design patterns, I mean, holy moly, it makes your programming life so much easier. So what is a design pattern? Let me show you. All right, so here's a design pattern from my course, BAS Programming Fundamentals. And the reason that the students in the course are being, basically the feedback I'm getting is, hey, I've been in this course eight hours and I know how to program. And to me, that is freaking dumbfounding because I spent a year and a half learning how to become semi-functional at programming. But here's why design patterns are so powerful. Think about supply fan, right? There's only so many ways to turn a supply fan on or off. And the thing is, is what I find with a lot of new programmers is that they spend a ton of time trying to figure out how to do maybe four or five tasks. They need to turn fans on and off. They need to switch between heating and cooling states. They need to open some valves. They need to open some dampers and maybe they've got some lead lag switching or some staging. I mean, those five or six kind of Real basic tasks are what the majority of the time you're going to spend in your programs is going to be focused on. So why not learn design patterns that go and show you how to write that code and then you just reuse it again and again and again. So I would love to say that I'm a freaking genius and I came up with this idea on my own, but I didn't. I practiced the Walmart philosophy, which is steal what works. I looked at the IT world. 
They train programmers all the time. And these programmers are able to learn code friggin' fast. How do they do it? Well, they do it through design patterns. Rather than rewriting code again and again and again and again, they have data adapter patterns, pub sub patterns, throttle patterns, etc., etc. And based on these patterns, they know which code to write. Well, why not do that with building automation? And that light bulb moment went off. And that is how I was able to teach my students to be able to program so fast. So let's go through a design pattern. Basically, what you do is you say, hey, I've got a supply fan. And I want to know when the fan is running but doesn't have status. And when the fan doesn't have status but is running. And if either of those scenarios are true, I want to lock the fan into failure. And then... I want to not allow the fan to start again until someone resets that alarm. Well, look at the code block. It's all right here. Occupancy command and the fan's not in failure. Great. Then the fan will be able to turn on. If, however, I turn on the fan and I don't have status, well, look at that. I don't have status and the fan's on. That and block is going, but I've got a 30 second delay to give status a chance to turn on. However, status won't turn on because I don't actually have a status point tied into this virtual controller. So eventually, if I talk long enough to distract you from the fact that this delay is counting down for the next 30 seconds, then we will go and have a true hit this OR gate which will lock this latch, which will make this not now turn false, which will keep the supply fan from running. And then all I need to do is hit my alarm reset, set it to true. That resets the latch. And then that starts the countdown all over again. And Bob's your uncle. This is how... You write a latching failure for a supply fan based on supply fan status. You can redo this code all day long. Copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste. You learn enough design patterns and booyah, you can write code super duper fast. And the really awesome thing about this is you use something called the snipping tool. You take a screenshot. Yes, save it, file save as, and you build your design pattern library. And now with your design pattern library, you simply go and say, oh, I've got something where I've got a supply fan that needs to start or a pump that needs to start. Doesn't have to be a supply fan. Could be a pump, could be a light, could be an exhaust fan, whatever. I've got something that's tied to status and run and I need a latching alarm. Boom, done, easy, print the money. Seriously, folks, this is how you become an awesome programmer is by doing this kind of trick. And if you'd like to learn more about design patterns, if you'd like to learn more about logic blocks, and you just like to be an all around friggin' awesome programmer, then you need to sign up for my programming course. No other course in the entire world teaches you to program. You can go to manufacturer training till you're blue in the face. They'll teach you about their product. They'll give you a workbook. You'll go and you'll spend a little time going through the workbook, following the exercises, and you'll leave and you won't know how to code. You go through my program. You spend eight hours. You go through all the sequences. You go through the exercises. You leave. You know how to code. It's that simple. All right, folks. In next week's episode... We're going to dive through optimization strategies. It's going to be a two-part episode. So episode one will be, or part one will be next week and the week after that. So we will start diving through optimization strategies, things like optimal start, things like economizer, things like pressure and temperature resets, things like zone averaging, load limiting, all of that stuff. We will start to unpack those topics. We'll even talk a little bit about things like ASHRAE 62.1, ASHRAE 55, ASHRAE 90.1. So we'll have a lot of fun as we go through those episodes. As always, got any questions? Hey, you know what? 
Who else out there is offering their time to answer their questions and make you a better BAS professional? Take advantage of it. Just go below the video, type your question in. If I know the answer, I'll tell you. If I don't know the answer, I'll let you join me on going and researching the answer. I'll show you how I went and found it. I don't know everything, but I know a hell of a lot. So feel free to take advantage of that and ask your questions below the video. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate the opportunity to serve you all and to help you all grow in your building automation professions. Thanks a ton, and I'll talk to you next week.